Hello, welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja. And today I'll be talking about Abdul Razak Gurna's novel, Paradise. Now, before I go into it, this is on a special request by the students of Sidi Mohammed bin Abdullah University in Fez from Morocco. So thank you for suggesting it. But a few qualifications before I get into it. First, usually when I record on any important novels of post-colonial studies, I've either published on the novel or have taught the novel or have at least read it several times. None of that applies to this novel because I just finished reading it this morning. So I think the request was sent to me two days ago, and I felt like if I have time, if I could read the novel carefully and then record a brief video on it, maybe it would be useful to, to the students of the university in Morocco and elsewhere as well. But just bear in mind that I have not had enough time to reflect on the novel, you know, for a, for a long time. So these are just my thoughts after having just read the novel once. Okay, so keep this disqualification in mind. And then we'll now briefly talk about the novel and its themes. Now the way I will go about it is first I will give you some brief information about the author himself, which you should already be aware of. He's the Nobel laureate, the Nobel Prize winner of last year. And then uh, I will give a little bit about the setting of the novel, both historical, temporal setting, and spatial setting, as I understand it. Then about some of the main characters, some main themes in the novel, and then a few words about the ending. But this is roughly my plan as I, you know, uh, finish this important con conversation about Abdul Razak Gurna's paradise. But we also have to talk about the title, right? So here we go. So a little bit about Gurna himself. Abdul Razak Gurna was born in what used to be the Sultanate of Zanzibar, which is now part of Tanzania. And he has lived in England most of his life. So he has British citizenship. I think he has published 14 novels. And until recently, he taught at University of Kent. He is now a professor emeritus of literature. And of course, brought to international fame after he won the Nobel Prize in 2021. So that's roughly about him. Now, about the setting of the novel, in terms of time, the novel is set in late 1880s, 1914. That's the time period before the beginning of the First World War. And uh, we encounter three fictionalized places. But so there are the coastal towns where the story starts then a major town where most of the action in the city happens and then there are journeys to the interior. Uh, and so that's roughly the spatial setting of the novel in present day Tanzania, which is East Africa. So let's see if I can share my screen with you. So I recorded this just on my phone and all it has is just you know the location of Tanzania on the um, in on the East African side of the African continent, and then roughly you could say, you know, if that's the country, somewhere around here is, of course, Tanzania is famous for a lot of things. It's got all these great lakes, and then. It also has what you call it, Mount Kilimanjaro, right? Which is the um, 
tallest mountain in Africa, and some of our actions happens in the foothills of the mountain and around the lake. So let us get to the meat of our conversation. Let's take a look at the plot, the characters, some major themes in my opinion, and then the question of the title of the novel, why is it called Paradise? And then a little bit about the story of Yusuf and Zulekha and its connection to the last part of the novel. And then a little bit about the ending. So the plot is pretty simple. We start in a small coastal town. The story is from mostly from the point of view of our young protagonist, Yusuf, right? And we start in a small coastal town. We are looking at the world through the eyes of Yusuf, who is 12 years old, and this grand uncle who's a, an Arab trader, right? Named Aziz visits. And then by the end of the first chapter or two, we learn that Yusuf is going to accompany Aziz all the way to live with him. We don't know the reason yet. And then it's the journey on the train to the city where we learn that Yusuf is not supposed to live with his uncle. Actually, Aziz is not really his uncle. And he works at the shop. That's the first leg of the story. And his experience is there. From there, he has his first journey into the interior where he's taken along with the trading expedition but then left in the foothills of Kilimanjaro, foothills of the lake, right? Lake Victoria, I think. And that's where he stays with the family for one year. And then his return back to the town of Aziz, his life there, and then his expedition with the trading expedition all the way into the interior, across the lake, into deeper part of Africa and his return from there and then what happens in the absence of his master in the ending. That's roughly the plot through the life of Yusuf, our main character, which takes us to the characters. There are quite a few characters there, but first and the foremost is Yusuf. Okay, that name is significant in Judaic tradition as well, Joseph, right, prophet. But in the Islamic tradition, Yusuf, right, is prophet Yusuf. There are hints here because historically that's the precedence that Gurna is using to create the character of Yusuf. He is 12 when he leaves his house and he has one important attribute. He is exceptionally beautiful gifted enough that people notice it, but they notice it, they marvel at it. There is something spiritual or miraculous about his beauty. Now, those of you who are familiar with the Muslim tradition already know that that is a clear reference to what we in Farsi call Husni Yusuf, right? The beauty of Joseph. So different prophets have different attributes for which they are famous in the Muslim tradition, right? So Moses, right, had the yade beza, the, 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 the hand that shone, right, bright hand. Jesus, Isa, had dame Isa. He could bring the dead to life with his breath, right? And Yusuf had Husni Yusuf. Right, the beauty of Yusuf. That's what the character is built on, that analog from Muslim history. And it is further reinforced towards the ending. But that's his biggest attribute. He's beautiful. And especially the Muslim characters in the story love that. They, they see him as a gift. Then is Uncle Aziz. You know, Uncle Aziz is an Arab trader. He's an adventurous trader. He's a complex figure. 
because he's benevolent, he's courageous, he's a practicing Muslim. But then he also practices something that is frowned upon, that is, he practices Rihani, which is that he loans a lot of money to a lot of people, and when someone gets too indebted to pay their debt, they give him their children in slavery, right? He owns their labor. That's how Yusuf ends up being with Uncle Aziz. So he's a complex figure, right? Very philosophical, very mysterious, as well as we see him through Yusuf's eyes. Then the characters who have an impact on Yusuf's life is, of course, Khalil. Khalil is the young man when Yusuf is brought to the city. He doesn't live in the master's house. He runs the shop with Khalil, and it's Khalil who teaches him about the realities of the world, his place. He tells him, Aziz is not your uncle. He owns you, just like he owns me because my parents owed him debt. Right? But Khalil is the one who is stuck at that place, right? who is represented as this character who knows his place in the world and does not know, knows that there isn't much he can do against the power of his master and others. right? And he also befriends Yusuf and becomes kind of like his big brother. Then other characters are, we meet them when um, Yusuf is taken into the interior and left at this shop, right, owned by uh, Hamid and his wife. Hamid is also a Muslim. He is a small-time shopkeeper. And Yusuf lives with them for one year. And during that time, they travel into the hills to trade, right? And there is a character who is sick, sick right, called a Singa. He's called, he's a mechanic. And then as they traveled into the mountains, they meet this other shopkeeper, Hussein, who is kind of a voice of criticism of Aziz and his practices, but he's also warning these people that things are changing, the Europeans are coming, right? And so pay a lot of attention to what he says, because that is a critique of the impending colonialism. And then there are two female characters towards the end of the novel, the mistress, Zuleikha, right, as we learn her name, that is significant. And then Amina, which we learn is Khalil's sister and was indentured at the same time as he, but she's an adopted sister. And now Aziz has married her, right? So these are some of the characters that we meet. And there are other characters too, Abdullah, the overseer, so he's this daunting figure. So out of these, Yusuf is the young character around which the story dwells, right? He, since it is a coming of age story, right? And he is reflective, he's beautiful, and he is seen as this beautiful being, and he's still trying to figure out the world. And most of the story is about him, it starts by him, on him, and it ends on his last action. Now let's go to the themes. Now this is a very complicated novel. It's not by numbers post-colonial novel. It's doing something very complex. First of all, it gives us the views of the Europeans. The views of the Europeans are from the point of view of the natives who are feeling the presence of Europeans. And Europeans to them are Germans. This is German territory, right? Germany has claimed it, they have colonized it. So Germans to them are implacable. They can eat metal, right? Um, they have weapons that can destroy cities or towns, right? and they are brutal about their law. You can't negotiate, you can't repent and say, oh, I know they're literalist about their law. Now, these are the views of the Germans given to us from the point of view of the natives. 
So there is a view of impending colonialism, but arrival of the Europeans. They are mythical creatures. They are also creatures of greed, right? They want things, things, right? But they have also implemented order. So there's a complex view of Europeans here. Another theme is the divisions that already exist within the society. We already know that there are different tribes, different religions, right? But one view that comes across very clearly, which is critical of the Arab encounter with Africa and the Muslim encounter with Africa is the way most of the Muslim characters see the native Africans, right? And that's very crucial to keep in mind, right? They see them as inferior. The, the vocabulary that they use for them is savages, which was the same vocabulary that the Europeans used, right? And they are disdainful of their religious practices. They think they are dangerous. So the Arabs in the story, the Muslim characters in the story, have the same view of the very natives of Africa with whom at least the Arabs have shared the continent for 1,000 years, the same kind of views that the Europeans would have. And that's the complication that he introduces, right? This distinction between the Muslim and then the Arab Muslims and their self-view and their view of the native Africans and their religions and their practices. So you will see that the Muslim characters seen, use the same vocabularies about African characters, about them being superstitious, you know, worshipping their puny gods as the Europeans used about generally the Africans. So that's a very important theme to keep in mind and tease out, right? Because that is a fissure in most African North African and East African societies is this advent of Islam and how much of the native cultures does it override, but how much does it not? And then another theme is about, I would say, question of power, right? What makes Aziz such a powerful figure? What makes Yusuf and Khalil into powerless figures, right? That's a major theme, right? What inequalities? And how do people view their lives when they are in equal, equal situations? What's a way out for them? Right? These are, in my view, some of the themes. Now, overall, of course, this is a coming of age now. This is how Yusuf grows up to be an adult, right? So this is a Bildungsroma, but it's in purely Tanzanian, African, within that Arab and Muslim context. So it's very particular. So these are some of the themes that I see. There are also themes of, you know, what are the perils of doing trade into the interior? How much courage did it take for Arab traders or any other traders to venture into into the interior of Africa, and then how subtle you had to understand the culture and negotiate it. And so those are also some of the themes. And then, of course, is the theme of love, right? Or lust, but mostly love. And that's where the novel is really interesting because it is retrieving one of the most beloved stories from the Quran, but also from the Muslim mythology of the story of Yusuf and Zulaikha. Now remember, Zulaikha was the wife of who? The Aziz of Egypt, Aziz al-Misr, right? Our main character, not main character, but Uncle Aziz is, of course, based in that. Her name is Zulaikha. Our young protagonist is Yusuf. The way it is staged, the encounter, he being invited in, and all the way to where Zulaikha finally reaches for him in passion, and he runs away, and his shirt is torn from the back, is what comes from the Yusuf and Zulaikha story when he's blamed for assaulting his mistress, his 
master's wife, his defense is, look, if my shirt is torn in the front, then I was the aggressor. But if my shirt is torn in the back, then she was the one going after me. And so it's in the Quran, but it's also in the public imagination as the story of this woman's love for the most beautiful man on the planet, Yusuf. Now, you know, in the masculinist Islamic narrative, Zulekha comes out to be this impetuous woman. But I see her as this character, as this woman who loves this man and is not afraid of following her passion, right? But remember that entire scenario of he, Yusuf, going into the house and Zulekha trying to seduce him is built on a purely Islamic myth of the story of Yusuf and Zulekha. And in order to really understand it, you will have to know that myth, right? And that's what also makes the novel really interesting. Right? We are in Africa in the house of an Arab character reenacting a story from the Quran, but also from the Arabic tradition. That's the beauty of it. Now going to the title of the novel, why call it paradise? I mean, of course, there are no conclusive answers for it. But first of all, the region of Africa we are in, it's described in great detail, especially when they visit Hussein, the shopkeeper in the foothills. He looks, he tells them, the light here is green. This is that magical paradise part of Africa. Beautiful, green, right? So literally, we could consider that. Then the house where Mr. Aziz, Uncle Aziz lives, Sayyid, right? Sayyidi Aziz lives. It has a garden, which is like a paradise. It's well maintained. It's beautiful. That's where Yusuf goes to find his peace. And then there are references in the discussion between Hussein and Hamid, and of course, Kala Singha, right? About the Muslim idea of heaven, the paradise. Like right? paradise is the last stage of the seventh heaven. But the way the Muslim paradise is imagined in the Quran and in the Muslim imagination, you could obviously think that it's a desert god who is imagining it because there are green, lush green valleys and you know, streams, and it's all through the imagination of someone who lives in a sparse, hostile land. So these are some of the references to the paradise, right? But is it ironic? I mean, is it really paradise? Such brutal things are happening to people here, right? So can we really consider it a paradise? Would another idea of the Muslim paradise is that you were born in it, as Adam and Eve, you were, you fell from it. And then based on your deeds, you will return to paradise. So these are some of my thoughts about paradise. Now about the ending. By the end of the novel, Aziz is on one of his lesser expeditions to go get rhino horn which he thinks if he could smuggle it out, he could recover his losses from what he had lost in the last expedition. And while that is happening, the mistress finally invites Yusuf in because she thinks he can cure the blemish on her cheek. But it's also that she desires him. But that's when Yusuf also learns that the young woman, Amina, of course, he knows that she's half sister of Khalil. But they fall in love. He knows he loves her. And his plan is to escape with her, right? to, to take her away. And that's what makes the ending kind of tragic, because there is nowhere they can run. There is no space for them. Right? He is owned by Aziz, right? She is Aziz's wife. And, and that's what Khalil tries to tell him, that this is our lot in life, right? And that is when the First World War is also starting. And they are told to stay indoors because the Germans are coming and they are going to you know, conscript people as porters and all. 
And that's exactly what happens, right? The German officer who is described in great detail as this menacing mechanistic presence, right? He doesn't even have his full jaw, right? And the last scene is that the, the Germans have captured people that they want as conscripts and they are leaving. Of course, they're using native soldiers. And as they are leaving, Khalil goes out and he's exploring where the troops had camped and he sees dogs eating, you know, whatever the refuse the soldiers had left even their excrement and they, Khalil realizes that's his lot in life, that he's not brave enough. He cannot change anything. And Yusuf also goes out, but he hears at the back that the doors of the house are being bolted against him. And he also knows he cannot go back. He cannot rescue Amina. And so we see him running towards the column of soldiers. That's as open-ended as you can make an ending, right? It's an open-ended ending because we don't know, we don't know what will happen to him. We don't do not know what he will do. Will he join the Germans? Will he join the army? We have no idea. So we can only speculate. So overall, you know, to conclude, it's a really beautiful but heartbreaking novel. It's the story of a young boy, Yusuf, who is given into slavery because of his parents' debt to this powerful Muslim Arab trader called Aziz. Aziz takes him to the city where Yusuf befriends Khalil, who is also an indentured slave, and they run the shop. Then the master takes Yusuf to the interior and leaves him there for one year because he suspects that his wife has developed an infatuation with him. Yusuf is exceptionally beautiful and his character is drawn from the historical tradition of Prophet Yusuf. He has this harrowing journey across the desert into the interior where they survive and come back. And then the final stages of the novel is he and Zuleikha's encounter, Yusuf falling in love with Amina and knowing that there isn't anything he can do. And then the master's return and he knowing that that's his lot in life. Maybe something will change because he's running away from that house and towards the military column, but we don't know what will change. That's all that I can say at this point about the novel. Thank you so much for listening to me. I hope this is useful. I'll try to gather some resources and post them in the description of this video. If you find something, please do share so that we can enrich everyone's experience. And once again, thank you for the students from Fez, Morocco for suggesting this lecture. And I hope this was useful to you. Do let me know what you think. Thank you so much. And as always, peace and love.